Well, good morning, everyone. I think we might get started. It's right on 10 o'clock already and we want to try and run to time today. Um, so thank you all for joining us um, and sending a warm welcome to everyone here with us today. Thank you for joining us uh, for this Research and Evaluation Network webinar. The theme of the webinar today is Data Storytelling Principles. Um, today is the second webinar in a three part series held over the month of September on data visualization for community service organizations. And we have uh, one more session after today's webinar, which will be on communicating impact and purpose with data. Um, just to note, if you have registered for one of these sessions, uh, you'll be registered for all three of the webinars in the series, uh, so you don't need to register multiple times. Uh, and so for those of you who have, may have missed um, the first session, I'll share the recording in the chat pane uh, with you now so that you can watch it in your own time. There we go. Um, so we are a large group today um, with over 240 registrations for today's event. Uh, so for the agenda, uh, I'm going to give a five minute introduction and an overview of the Research Evaluation Network and tell you a bit more about the Research and Evaluation Network resources on Community Door um, and the QCOS Data Hub. And then I'm going to hand it over to our guest speakers for today's event, Catherine Baker and Nadia De Beers, who will give the presentation on data storytelling pr uh, principles. Um, there'll be some time for some Q&A after the presentation, um, and I'll also highlight some upcoming opportunities that you may like to get involved with. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things to note. Uh, by default, you will be on mute, but your camera will be turned on. Um, so this session will be recorded. So if you don't want your face shown in the recording, please feel free to turn your camera off. Uh, if during Q&A you'd like to ask a question, you can write the question in the chat function. Um, there is a Q&A function as well, but I'd just suggest uh, including it in the chat. Um, the other option is you can put your hand up using the raise, raise your hand emoji um, and then take yourself off mute to ask the question. Uh, and if we do run out of uh, time today, we can follow up with you individually um, after the session. Um, so just pop your question in the chat pane uh, and we'll follow up with you. Uh, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. I acknowledge the Yuggera and Turrbal people of the lands on which I live here in Mianjin, Brisbane, and I'd like to pay my respects to all First Nations colleagues joining us online today. QCOS thanks First Nations peoples for the gift of the Uluru Statement from the heart, and we look forward to continue supporting work leading to a successful referendum announced now to be held uh, on the 14th of October. QCOS welcomes the invitation to walk with our First Nations peoples in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. For those online, please feel free to join us in acknowledging country where you are today through the chat function as well. Um, my name is Amy Dellett and I'm the data and reporting analyst in the research and policy team at QCOS and I coordinate our research and evaluation network webinars in our online forum as well as providing um, data capability support to our QCOS uh, to QCOS internally and externally to our members as well. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch um, or provide any feedback on the network our team's email address is research at qcos.org.au um, and as a quick overview for those who may be new to the network, um, the purpose is really about um, collaboration and knowledge sharing with the intention of identifying shared challenges and emerging issues in the community services sector, which then allows us to respond and provide advice on matters relating to research and evaluation. And it's also an opportunity to share perspectives um, and shape the QCOS research and evaluation agenda. Uh, so just a reminder, you can access our Research and Evaluation Network webinar recordings and resources on the Community Door a Research and Evaluation Resources Hub page uh, or on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I'll share the, uh, the links in the chat pane for you now to explore these resources further. There's a few links in there. Um, so we also have a Research and Evaluation Forum that sits within uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and we currently have 81 members and guests on the forum. And the idea behind the forum is we're, that we're providing a space um, and an opportunity for our network members to collaborate and exchange ideas um, and access professional development opportunities. And it's also the best way to stay up to date with news about the network and um, our network webinars. So I've, I've shared all that information on how to join the forum in the chat. 
Um, and this is the last slide from me um, for, before I hand it over to Catherine and Nadia today. Um, so I also just wanted to let you know we have a dedicated landing page uh, for the data work that we do at QCOS and it's called the QCOS Data Hub. Um, and at the moment we have two main pieces of work there. We have the social housing register data dashboards for Queensland, which were made available on our website last year. Um, and they've recently been updated to June 2023 data release. And then we also have the uh, QCOS Town Hall community data profiles, which were released recently uh, to our website. Um, and the go. profiles, oh, sorry. Um, the profiles provide an overview of selected indicators that align with the QCOS policy focus areas of housing, youth justice, living affordability, women's equality, children and young people and community services. Um, so they were specifically collated for our QCOS Town Hall events, which are held from August to October uh, this year and across a number of regions in Queensland. And so these pr profiles are collated for these specific locations and are also available for other additional areas of interest uh, informed by feedback received from the sector. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers for today's event, Catherine Baker and Nadia De Beers from SEA Data um, and Analytics. So SEA Data and Analytics is an organisation um, that I think particularly does well to support organisations uh, to tell their own data stories. Uh, we hosted a webinar with SEA last year, so it's really lovely to have you guys back again. Um, and we showcased uh, the data work of Gladstone Region engaging in action together and the work they're doing around data and the storytelling of that data with the Gladstone community. Um, and so SEA provides the data support and the platform to enable some of that work to happen. Um, and I thought I'd share the recording of that webinar with you today as an additional resource. And I'll hand it over to Catherine and Nadia to introduce themselves um, and provide the presentation on data storytelling principles. So again, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, and I will now stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you, Catherine and Nadia. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you so much to everyone who's taken the time to join us today to learn more about data storytelling principles. Um, we thought we'd first just share a little bit about who we are, um, each of us. I'll go first and then hand over to Nadia. So my name's Catherine Baker and I'm a multimedia designer and marketing specialist. And I first connected with a love of visual storytelling way back in film school many years ago. And um, that's continued as I've pivoted into a career in marketing and through many diverse industries from development to data. And so I've been the head of marketing now for SEA Data and Analytics for three years, during which time I've been honored to not only share the story of SEA Data, but many organizations who we've helped to tell data stories in the ways that are most meaningful to them. Um, thanks, Kat. Hi, everyone. I'm Nadia. I'm a data analyst here at SEER. I have a degree in pure maths, and I've always had a love for numbers and teaching. Uh, prior to becoming a data analyst, I was working in the ed tech space for an online maths textbook where I created lessons, videos, and problems for students to use. Um, I decided to get into data because I think it's the perfect mix of maths, problem solving, teaching, and human interaction. Um, I completed a data science boot camp last year, and I've been working at SEER for the last four months. All right, so in today's session, we are going to um, step you through our data storytelling principles, which fall into a four-step approach. In this process, we'll have tips in each section, and we'll end with some Q&A. And as Amy said, feel free to pop your questions in the chat um, and we will answer them at the end. Also, just yell at me if anything's gone wrong because I can't <laughs> see it, any of you. All right, so let's get started. If you've ever Googled data storytelling, you've probably noticed that there's a plethora of articles that pop up. And when there's so much information available, it can be really overwhelming and hard to know where to start. At least that's how I feel. So in our presentation today, we're hoping that we can offer you a source of truth and provide a guide of the start to end process of data storytelling. And so before we tell you what it is, or sorry, rather how to data storytell, I wanted to just quickly define what data storytelling means. 
So data storytelling is the blend of narrative, visuals, and um, data into one single seamless experience. And these stories can take the form of a dashboard, a newsletter, a presentation, or any other space where this can all come together. Data on its own is just numbers. And no matter how interesting those numbers are, particularly for us data-centric people, people connect with the stories they tell as opposed to just numbers themselves. So hence the importance of data storytelling. If we wanna share information in a meaningful way, it's really important that we tell a story. And when I was thinking and prepping for this webinar, I love doing deep dives. And I was thinking, why is storytelling uh, so much so important? And why does it resonate with people more than numbers? And I found this really interesting fact that I wanted to share. When someone hears a story, multiple parts of the brain are engaged, including the Wernick's area, which controls language comprehension, the amygdala, which processes emotional response, and mirror neurons, which play a role in empathizing with others. So when multiple areas of the brain are engaged, the hippocampus, which stores short-term memories, is more likely to convert the experience of hearing a story into a long-term memory. So there we go. We have proof that telling stories is really the most impactful way to share data. Over to you, Kat. So we, we wanted to really um, simplify this. And so we've developed a simple four-step process for telling impactful data stories, which is simplify. Sorry, I, identify simplify, visualize, and humanize. So identify the most important or impactful data stories for your intended audience, then simplify how you can tell this data story in the most simplistic way so that anyone could understand it. Visualize, this is the art and science of influencing attention towards the most important information via visual elements. And then humanize, layering your story with human elements allows your audience to connect with it emotionally. All right. So the first step in telling a data story, as Kat mentioned, is identify, which is finding the most important or impactful data stories for your intended audience. So what this means is that we're going to identify the data that will act as the base of our data story. There are a couple of ways that we can do this, um, but I find that it usually is derived from one of two situations. Either we have a question in mind from the beginning and we seek out data to answer that question, or we have a data set with no question in mind and we explore that data in order to find interesting, impactful, or compelling information. So for the sake of an example um, that we're going to use throughout this presentation, we're going to consider the latter of these two scenarios. So Kat and I today are going to pretend that we are a um, not-for-profit that connects youth refugees to mental health services. We've been collecting data on our clients in order to assess the results of our services and guide our strategic de decisions for the future. Today, the data story audience or the people that we're going to tell our data story to are going to be our mental health service providers. We want to showcase the impact of their work, as well as which services are the most impactful for our clients, the refugees. So in order to tell a story, story to this specific audience, we're going to focus on the impact measurements of the mental health services and present this back to those mental health service providers. Hopefully that's clear enough for you all. Um, and you'll hear me say this many times today, so I'm sorry. We just really wanna hit home that in the process of data storytelling, it's crucial to know your audience and keep that in mind at every single step in this process. All right, so we've created a data set and I just want to make it known that this is fake. So you're not viewing any personally identifiable information. Um, entirely made up data, so don't stress. Um, this is a unit record level data set, which is a fancy way to say that each row of the data set 
um, is either a person or a thing. So for example, in that first row there, we're talking about a single person. Um, also, yeah, I mentioned this is fake data, good. So um, you can see that we've collected a few things in our data set. We have demographics, a mental health assessment, which comes in the form of a score, uh, the support program or service, which our clients are referred to, their participation, um, the satisfaction and feedback of those programs and services, as well as the impact metrics. So since we don't have a direct question that we're going to um, answer, we can explore the data set and see what compelling information emer emerges. And this is called EDA in the data world or exploratory data analysis. Um, this is generally done in code, Excel, or just by eyeballing the data. Now, something to note when we're looking through a data set for interesting information is that oftentimes the absence of value or data is just as interesting as a large number. So for instance, if we had um, one of our services showed a 0% improved well-being, that would be quite interesting information and we might wanna share that. So just something to keep in mind. So after a bit of exploring through the data that I did offline, um, we've arrived at this aggregate data set, which I think um, contains interesting information for our service providers. Now, I'm going to keep defining things because I think it's really important that we're all on the same page. An aggregate data set is another fancy way of saying a data set where we've chosen a variable and aggregated it. So for instance, if we wanted to know how many 10 to 12 year olds were in our data set, we would count up the rows for which that was true. And that result is an aggregate data set. Okay, so we've gone ahead and we found the percentages of our uh, clients, the refugees, who have stated that they either have an improved well being, that they're integrated in society, that they're employed, or that they're receiving education after attending one or more uh, sessions of the service or program that we've referred them to. So, for instance, um, if we've referred our clients to a community based health program, 78.7% of them have cited that they have an improved well being after the fact. Now, all these measurements are important, interesting, and tell a story. However, given our audience and given what we want to show them, which is the impact that they're having overall on the well being of the clients, we're just going to focus on improved well being, as this is a more generic metric. So now that we've um, decided what we're looking at, I've gone ahead and ordered these from greatest uh, to lowest. And you can see that we've identified the data that's going to dictate the rest of our data story, which is we'll be looking at the percentage of our clients who report an improvement in well-being after attending one of these services or programs. So when we're going about identifying our um, insight or what's going to be the base of our data story, we would recommend first off determining how you'll be identifying this insight. So do we have a question that we'd like to answer or rather are we going to be exploring a data set? If we're exploring a data set, make sure to be open and curious when you're approaching the data set. Um, like I said, sometimes the absence of information is just as interesting. So make sure to pull out lots of different variables and look at them alongside each other. And lastly, Again, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this so many times, um, know your audience. This is just the most helpful guide when it comes to making a decision of what insight we'll be looking at. All right. So the second step in creating a data story is determining how we can tell this story in the most simplistic way so anyone could understand it. Um, Kat's probably heard me talk about this heaps. So this is one of my greatest passions, and I think it's because I come from a mathematics background, which is so jargon heavy, and it's so hard to sift through a maths textbook and glean information. So it's really important to me that every information that I share with people, whether it's a data story or not, is as simple as possible. So in order to simplify our insight, I've gone ahead and written down what I showed you in the previous slides, the data, into a singular statement, which is the service or program most likely to result in an improved well-being score for a youth refugee is a physical activity program 
88.3% reported improvement, followed by an English language course, 82.8% reported improvement. Now, the first step, which is no surprise to you at this point, <laughs> is to know your audience. And so what I mean by that is that we want to make sure that the language that we're using is um, makes sense for the intended audience, which in this case are mental health service providers or mental health professionals. So we can use language that will resonate with them. Now, the language in this site in this insight is already quite tailored to those service providers, but I would assume that these service providers have a pretty thorough knowledge as to what well-being means, right? They're in the mental health space, we'd hope that's the case. And so what I'd like to do, instead of changing any language, is actually add a little caveat so there's no room for misinterpretation as to what well-being score means. So as you can see, I've just gone ahead and given um, some indication of how we came about these averages. All right, the next most, um, probably my favorite step in simplifying an insight is to drop the jargon. So even if we use the right vocabulary for our audience, if we're using heaps of jargon in any insight, it's gonna be hard uh, to obtain information from that. Basically, the less linguistical barriers that we put up, the easier it is to understand. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace um, the phrase result in the improved well-being score with something that's easier to understand. How about just improve the well-being of? It's a lot easier to take in, and I believe that if anyone were to read this, that would probably make more sense to them. So with more technical insights, we'll probably see more jargon. There isn't too much here, but this is a really crucial step in simplifying our insight. Lastly, even if we're using the most relevant jargon-free language, if your insight isn't concise, it's just going to be harder to understand. So when we shorten our insights or make them more concise, it's important that we also don't strip away any meaning. So we can do this by using um, direct language as opposed to uh, fluff language. And um, I like to also ask myself, what are we trying to say here? What is the purpose of this insight? And so what we're trying to do is showcase the positive impact that our partner service providers are having on our clients' lives, um, as well as show them which services are the most impactful. So with that in mind, um, I've gone ahead and made our insight more concise. I've taken out the numbers because they're not really necessary. And I've just made it into a single statement that I think anyone could understand. So what we have as a result of that is that the programs most likely to improve the well-being of a youth refugee are physical activity programs and English language courses. So if we were to go back and compare this to the first, um, I won't because there are a lot of slides in here, um, you can see that we've really done a number and it's going to be so much easier for anyone to understand this insight. And so the tips that we'd recommend following when it comes to simplifying your insight is to know your audience's language, think about what types of words or language would most resonate with them, drop the jargon, don't create more uh, linguistic barriers than necessary, and remember that a concise insight is a better insight. All right, over to you, Kat, for Visualize. Thank you. Um, so this is probably the step that most that people are the most familiar with, the visualised step, the art and science of influencing attention towards the most important visual elements. Um, so if we move to the next slide, as, as we've talked about, <laughs> um, every data visualisation should have a defined audience and it should also have clear objectives. Now there's fundamental objectives that every data visual, visualization should have, which are to be as honest and accurate as possible, to deliver a clear message and to be visually appealing. So if you start with these fundamental objectives and then add your own, such as clearly delivering the message um, about how physical activity programs for refugees can improve um, well-being, then you start to get really clear on what your visualization needs to do before you start creating it. The, the type of data visualization that most that people are the most familiar with are charts. So just very quickly, I wanted to cover why we use charts.
charts. Charts are a super, effect, super effective way of visually presenting data, and it does make it much easier to scan for patterns and changes and trends um, than if you're just looking through huge tables of data. However, even though it's sort of easy for the eye to scan across and pick out what's different, it doesn't necessarily instantly tell you what those differences are and more importantly, what they mean. So people often let us know here at SIA that they kind of don't always know where to start looking at a chart to, to understand what's the most important and why. So does this mean that you should add lots and lots of text next to a chart to explain it? Well, you could do that, however, that may just create more of a mental barrier um, when you're presenting a data visualization to an audience and asking them to understand it. Data storytelling isn't just about having all of the information together on one page. The order in which you actually deliver or ask your audience to digest that information is just as important as the information itself. So how do we actually intentionally set that order of information and influence how it's interpreted by the audience. Well, once again, it all starts with our brain and our eyes actually work in partnership with our brain constantly to decode visual elements by scanning for differences or patterns. And this is actually a deeply instinctive thing as our brains are programmed to look for changes in our environment to keep us safe. And usually the visual element that is the most different is what we typically see first. So if you can reflect for a moment on when you first saw this image that's now on screen, the way someone's eye, eyes would be drawn across this image, most people would see the red antlers first. Your eye is drawn across and those stand out as the most different element in this image. And then your eyes drop down to recognize the dog's face. Likewise with this next image, our eye comes across and then we're drawn to the red shed here because it's the brightest and the boldest and it tends to be what our eyes are able to decode first of all. Even though red is usually the color that will always stand out the most, that's not to say that that's what you should always go to and use to highlight your key information. What you should instead actually do is decide on an entire color palette that you're going to use for your data visualization and then identify which colors in that color palette are the most bold. And then you utilize those to apply to the most important information. So if we move to the next slide, now that we've sort of covered what those fundamentals are of how the eye is drawn, we can really use this to our advantage in data stories. And a really good way is to pick out a key piece of information from your chart, the, the main thing that you want your audience to retain and present it as an extraction sitting next to a chart. You can make it prominent, simple to interpret and apply a color. The other data in this particular chart is still relevant. It's showing the comparison to other types of, of refugee services um, that also have an impact on well-being. But we can see that the physical activity one here in this um, made up example has the um, highest impact. So what happens here with our eye is. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> no worries. Um, <clears throat> So your eye comes across the chart and, and, and that's important. You still see that there's a chart there and you're quickly able to make the correlation that there's an 83% increase in well-being reported for youth refugees and your brain does make that correlation that it relates to the specific bar in the chart um, because of the color, use of color. That's all good. So now we're on to colour and we'll move to our colour slide because colour really is one of the most powerful tools we have in data storytelling. We can use it to draw the eye. We can create those correlations we just saw between pieces of information and that all makes things easier to interpret. Some really good rules of thumb for working with colour uh, to first determine that overall colour palette that I mentioned. And, and do some research into the psychology of colour. Different colours mean different things and they actually resonate in different ways with different audiences. Um, 
And the other thing you can do that I think is really important is to research how do you make your data visualization more approachable for people who may be vision impaired, for example. And there's lots of information out there about making charts and visualization suitable for people who may have color blindness, um, or you can even add an audio file next to your chart to explain what it's saying and make it approachable and accessible for everybody. Another really great tool in our toolbox when we're um, doing data visualizations is to use icons, really simple icons placed next to insights or statements can help tell your audience what they're about before they have to read anything. So definitely recommend the use of them wherever possible, but they can be tricky to work with because if you want to create a page or a report where you've got lots of different icons sitting together side by side, even if they're the same width and height, it can make them, it can be really hard to make them look like they're working together. And this is because our eyes actually see the negative space around the icon itself. Um, so that autopilot, autopilot part of the brain that I was talking about before, that's constantly scanning for differences. It wouldn't matter how you scaled these, your eyes just going to scan across them and go different, different, different each time. It's really tricky to, to make them the same, even if they're all the same um, style. So a really great tip here of how to overcome that if we just go back to the circles for a sec, yep, is to just very simply place a shape behind all of your icons. So now when our eye scans across, we're seeing this uniformity of our icons rather than focusing in on the differences. And it actually makes the icons themselves easier to interpret. And um, if we move ahead one slide, it actually doesn't really matter what the shape you place behind is. It could be a square, a circle, a teardrop like this one. As long as the shapes behind are uniform, we will get that um, impression of sophisticated uniformity. So the next slide is our visualized tips. Um, clearly defining your audience and the purpose of your data visualization. What is the key information you'd like your audience to retain from that visualization? Looking at whether you can pair a chart with simple icons and statements to draw out a single data story in, a re in really simplified language the, in the way that Nadia showed you. That's going to spark curiosity um, for people to want to understand more and then by placing your icons in a shape, um, that will just make it much easier to have an overall synergy to your composition. And definitely make use of color. Be really strategic with the color before applying. Use images and graphics um, to draw the eye and connect your audience to the story. And we're going to show you a little bit more how to do that in the next um, piece of the presentation. which is humanize. Um, and it is a really important um, part of data storytelling. And what it's about is layering your, sto your data story with human ele elements and that allows, so that it allows your audience to connect emotionally. And I think, um, you know, we hear so many numbers all day, every day on the radio and the news, like there's never any shortage of numbers but people don't actually connect to the numbers themselves. They really do connect to the stories. So the ultimate aim of any data storytelling and visualization is to make your audience feel something by connecting to emotion and empathy. So I wanted to build on our earlier example where we, we brought together a simple chart and an icon and a really simple statement and just show you another sort of tool that you have in your toolbox um, to help connect people to the story. So when we were looking at those images and noticing where the eye was drawn and those really simple images, and we pointed out that you always notice what's different first, well, something that comes in even above that is that our eyes will always be drawn to a human face first. 
And you can really use this to maximize the impact of your visualization. So it's not always going to be possible to use stock photography or real photography, real photography of real people, if that's possible to include in your data story, that's always going to be the most powerful. Um, if you have the resources and ability to find stock images that personify the data story that you're trying to tell, they, they still can be really powerful. Um, but it's really it's a really good thing to know about how much the eye is drawn to a human face. So when we bring all these elements together like this, our eye would be drawn across the chart and to the human face, then drop down to see the bold icon and then the percentage and make that correlation. So what you're actually doing here is by connecting on a human level with your audience, you're actually compelling them more to understand the more complex information in the chart. So they first understand the human element, the less complex element, and they're more compelled then to understand the most complex rather than com presenting the most complex upfront and trying to explain it. So once we know that we have a compelling visual structure, we can then really look to tell a compelling human story. So I wanted to just tell you two stories and, and just ask you to observe which one connects more with you if you were hearing it for the first time. So story one, an 83.3% increase in wellbeing is reported by youth refugees enrolled in physical activity programs. So that's story one. I, 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 I've got some information there. It's pretty clear and straightforward, but I'd love to just tell you the second story and see how it compares. This is Zane. Zane is two years old and he is one of over two, 12 and a half thousand refugees who have arrived in Australia in the last year. He and his mum, Jamelia, are enrolled in a physical activity program for refugees. This is shown to improve well-being by 83.3%. Now, often what people can do when they hear a story like that is they are reminded of a two-year-old in their life. They can think of a niece or a nephew or a grandchild or their own child. You can make that instant connection of empathy to that two-year-old and you can connect it to your own life. It can also be really effective as well, if we move on to the next slide, to actually not use a chart and present that same data story in, in a completely visual way and represent the 80% of people who reported an improved well-being with really simple icons and colouring the icons to represent the 80% as closely as possible. So we wanted to show you what this looks like if we then bring all of these elements together into a single data story that you might see in a report or a dashboard um, or any type of material that you might want to produce. So typically what our eye is going to do is follow that same pattern of being drawn to the human eye first. So, and that's why the placement of the human faces are in the top right. That's a really um, strategic positioning because what that does, because we know we, people read left to right, we want the eye to take in the fact that there is a chart with some really complex detail information there, but to come across to the face. And then the audience can connect to the story, the more human story on the page. And once again, we're creating that compelling reason to want to learn more. So you're drawing across the visual to the story down to a testimonial. And that's that in the testimonial can be um, from a survey piece of survey data or um, or it can even be a made up like what would this person say um, if if, you know, given that they're not a real person, um, actually making up a quote um, can just really give a voice to those people and um, really highlight the, the message behind the data. And then 
just building up all those different layers of information in your data story um, will help to actually draw people into the data. So we've added here as well, um, when thinking about bringing together a more complex data story like this, some things that you might like to consider. What is the data showing and why does it matter? Like how can you communicate to your audience what you're trying to show them and why does it matter? And then who are the people in the data? So when you start thinking about who are the people in the data, then you can start getting creative around is there a, is there a commentary from a real person we could we could source uh, is there a, a made up character that we could create to be the voice of this data what is the narrative and the story here and then wherever possible layering in real lived experience in the form of videos and audio files or written quotes on the page that is going to take the data story to the next level because you're really then actually um, communicating that from the voice of the people experiencing what you're trying to show. So that's sort of the culmination of how our four step process comes together and our key tips on the humanized section of the four step process uh, to use real lived experience or community voice if possible, using real life people images if possible is also great if that is possible, and then bringing in other multimedia elements, video, audio, using written quotes. If you don't have that real lived experience, then creating a character to personify your data. And also another tip is to sometimes use whole numbers as well as percentages. So when we see the percentage 83.3%, we don't always recognize the number of people that that data is talking to. So if we put a number to that and we said 68 people, that is sometimes more meaningful than the percentage. And sometimes it's really worthwhile having both as well. So we know it's 83% and that equates to 68 people. Really try and make the people speak in the data. And then, so we've put together our summary tips into a flyer for you with this four step process for identify, simplify, visualize and humanize. Um, but we just wanted to stop here and also see if there's any questions. You stunned everyone. <laughs> um, I'll just share my screen again. Thanks, Amy. We do have some time for uh, for questions, so feel free to take yourself off mute or ask anything in the chat for our guest speakers. Um, I don't think we received any questions um, in the registration for today's event, so nothing came through. Um, there's just some comments saying um, the presentation was great. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Is there any recommendations for good psychology of colour textbooks to look up? That's from Kylie. Kat, that might be yes. one for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can um, add some links. So on the resources page um, that Amy's shared, we've put some reference links there, but I can definitely add a ref reference link there for Psychology of Colour because it's really, really interesting. And um, even gender-wise, um, males will um, be more drawn and attached to some colours than females. So um, yeah, definitely worth researching. I'll, I'll add a link there. Great, thank you. Um, and then we've also got um, a question around how important are titles and fonts with presenting data? I think when you're pulling together a, a data story that has many visual elements to it, like a chart as well as a statement and things like that, it's really 
it's the similar to formatting a document or a web page where you want to have a hierarchy of scale with your font. So you want to identify what's the style of your heading, what's the style of your body copy, make sure you keep it consistent and make sure that you don't have too many different scales. So if you have four kind of headings and they're all different sizes and different colors on a page that can make people go i'm not sure which is the most important first so just like with determining a color palette before you get started determinist determining that overall style is really helpful and trying to stick to it for consistency as much as possible um, there's a few more questions coming in. Um, so from Janice, um, she said, you mentioned about creating a testimonial. If we do not have access to one, what advice do you have around doing this practically uh, while accurately portraying the data and making sure it's honest and authentic? It's a great question. It is a great question. Um, and um, I think, so in that example that we showed where, um, we were trying to give a voice to one of the people engaging in a fictitious um, physical activity program for refugees. Um, if you really zero down into your data and you think about that one person, it does allow you to create a story like that, um, which I think when you present a story like that, um, you can allow people to feel the emotion and then say afterwards, Zane's not a real person or Jamelia is not a real person. But because the point of the story that you're telling was being that the physical activity program improved well-being, I think it's okay to have that creative license because you're not telling anything that's not true. The two and a half thousand refugees is the average number that um, Australia accepts each year. So you can have you can draw and think as much reality as, as you like, and you're just bridging with a character narrative just to bring it to life for people so that they actually think of the people as, as real people rather than numbers. But it is a great question. Um, it was something that struck me so deeply when I first started working with data and you start looking at these data tables and you see the number 34 there, and I just would always think that's 34 people. And I would imagine the 34 individual people as if they were standing in a room. Um, and I think for me, that's how I really connected to the data um, itself. So I wanted to help other people learn to, to do that. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we've got a couple more questions coming through as well. Um, so any recommendations on use of colour across charts? You spoke about using the boldest colour to visualise most important data, but how do you balance that with using the same colour for the same information across visualisations? So um, the same colour for a particular program type? Yeah, look, it's not always easy to do because there's um, limited colours. And so you once you start with a palette, um, and I always tend to start, if I'm working with any chart, I'll look at how many variables there are that might need to have a different colour um, and think, OK, there's, there's maybe, there's perhaps five that are different, but I need a colour palette of 10. So you could create a colour palette of 10 by creating um, a lighter shade of those five colors that you want to use. So that gives you more expansion in your palette. Um, and then you have to really test out the color architecture that you're applying. Orange means this, purple means that. Um, and sometimes as you build out more charts and visualizations, it may not be possible to always apply a meaning to a color. Um, and so you may have to change it per data story um, as long as it's clear and you think about what people are looking at in one view you can get it to work um, and people there's different schools of thoughts around using red in a chart some people are like definite no we don't use red it's um it's perceived as bad some people want to have more traffic light of um, red is bad yellow is on the way 
green is good. There's there's all sorts of ways that you can apply it. Um, and it is it is quite complex, but just thinking about what you want to try and achieve with colour before applying any and working out how many do I need on my palette, just as if you were doing a painting, how many colours of paint do I need to put out on my paint palette before I do this painting and create the colours I need. Great. We also um, had some really great tips um, in our last session as well, which I shared the recording um, to the link of that. Um, it was on data presentation best practices too. So I think between the two webinars, we've got a lot of options in terms of probably maybe too many options now with, you know, how we can present data and, and ideas. So I think it's it's really great to have this recording as a reference as well. So there was a, a question asked of whether it be recorded. Um, so we'll share that uh, with the post event materials as well. Um, and there was one more question which was from Sarah. What sources do you prefer to use for infographics as opposed to charts, i.e. the 8 out of 10 people as opposed to 80%? Yeah, that's a great question as well because um, it's great if you can always use the same style of icons. Um, there's lots of great free libraries for icons um, and um, even I've noticed like input inbuilt icon libraries for um, some of the Microsoft suite. Uh, what else? Um, Noun project has great free icons, the Noun project. Um, so it's great to have a library of icons, but you really, in terms of making them all look the same, you can um, get away with a lot when you put them all in the same shape background. So even if the style is a little bit different, they tend to work together. So definitely have a look at the Noun project to grab some. That sounds great. Um, I will look that out. Um, so I think that's all the questions. Um, I just have some uh, some a few more slides to go uh, for anyone who wants to duck off early, they can, but um, I'll be sharing some resources to upcoming opportunities. Is there any other questions? We probably have time for one more. I think they've all kind of come through though. I just thought, um, yeah, I would like to reflect. I really like the fourth stage process. I think you simplified that really well. So the identify, simplify, visualize and humanize. I think that's really great um, to follow. And um, I thought with the identify step, um, you know, it, it made me reflect on, you know, when we have a question in mind and um, explore the data to find the question, it's good to differentiate that as opposed to, oh, when we don't know what we don't know and let's go explore the data for, for you know, answers that we might find as opposed to, you know, having thinking we know something with our intuition or a gut feeling, but then, um, you know, what can the data say to prove or validate that point of, of correction? And so, yeah, it was it's interesting to kind of uh, separate that out. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say a big thank you to you both. Um, very generously for offering your time on such a busy week for you. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate your enthusiasm um, and we look forward to seeing all of the great outcomes of um, the data and story storytelling work that you're um, supporting community organisations with through CR. Through um, so briefly, I've just uh, collected a list of of people, actually, I thought I'd share some um, ex additional resources just to kind of have a think about this topic a bit more. Um, so I collected a list of people who, in my view, are really wonderful data storytellers and they convey information in a way that makes it really meaningful um, and that evokes emotion or action to make change or, or they walk through the data in a way that has impact and purpose. And so the way in which they communicate data is engaging and the language that they use really resonates with the audience. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people have passed on their knowledge and their wisdom through generations of storytelling. And so in my role, I draw inspiration from many First Nations colleagues and, and leaders working in this space. 
and giving voice to um, the stories and the data and advocating for better use of data to result in meaningful outcomes for their communities. And um, my background is um, public health. So I particularly love listening to and learning from First Nations people uh, working in um, the health sector. So um, people including Alex Brown, Kalinda Griffiths um, and Dr. Ray Lovett. Um, and I've included some of the links to the videos um, where these leaders unpack the meaning behind data in their respective fields of work. Um, so I've also included uh, in the list um, some professionals who work in data eval evaluation, which you may draw inspiration from their content and storytelling, uh, including Eli Holder, Paul Flateau, Jia Hui Nung, and Hans Rosling, um, Ben Wellington, and Dominic Bohan. So I'll just share these in the chat with you and you can feel free to explore all of these presentations further. Lots of ideas um, and really worth the while taking the time to, to listening some, to some of these data storytelling approaches. Um, I think it's also really appropriate to acknowledge um, our storytelling capability of our previous guest speakers for the research and evaluation network who are working in the sector and they really have incredible stories to tell with their data. Um, so I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge them for being really courageous to tell their data stories of their organisations and their communities. Um, and you can find all of these recordings from our previous webinars uh, on the Community Door uh, Research and Evaluation page uh, link that I shared earlier in the presentation. Um, and I thought I'd also just share a slide here on additional resources you can read and watch um, if you'd like to learn more about data storytelling. Uh, I won't share these in the links in the chat at the moment because I'm aware we've shared lots and lots of links, um, but they will be in the uh, slide deck for you to access when that's shared. Um, so just coming up as well, um, there's an introduction to storytelling with data uh, one day workshop. And I'll just share some links of the upcoming events in the chat now. Um, so if you want to learn further about this topic, um, QUT is hosting a workshop specifically for the not-for-profit um, sector and organisations on how to uh, take data and communicate effectively, applying storytelling strategies that explain your social impact. Um, so it's an in-person event in Brisbane on the 6th of November, and it's offered at a heavily discounted rate for not-for-profit organisations. Um, it's also facilitated by the wonderful Dr. Ruth Knight, who was our guest speaker earlier on in the year around um, building a data-driven culture. Um, and also, I just wanted to share um, some information on the Data Catalyst Network, which is the national group supported by InfoExchange and the Paul Ramsey Foundation. Um, and it's specifically designed for the not-for-profit sector. And one component of the work is around data capability. Um, and it's like a community of practice. So they're sharing insights and projects uh, at a national scale for organisations uh, with a bit of a higher level of data maturity. Um, so there's an upcoming uh, Data Catalyst Network webinar tomorrow at 11 a.m with guest speakers from the Department of Social Services that will be sharing insights on how to work with DSS and DEX data to better understand outcomes. Um, and they'll step through the SCORE, the Standard Client Outcomes Reporting Framework, uh, understanding DEX reports and how to access DEX data. Um, so to register for future Data Catalyst Network uh, webinars, you can email Kristen Moller-Saxon from InfoExchange, uh, and I've included her details in the, in the chat. Um, also, we have our next webinar in this series is on Monday, the 25th of September. So in a couple of weeks time, uh, we'll, we'll hear from community services uh, working with data and communicating impact and purpose with their data. Um, and that will uh, have two guest speakers for that event um, from Brisbane Zero and ACOS. We also have a webinar planned for October, and this one will be an introduction to qualitative research methodologies, and it's open for registration. So I've shared that in the link uh, to register in the chat pane there too. Um, further on the horizon for October, we also have a presentation by Jill Lavelle uh, on cross-cultural evaluation and accountability. And in November, there'll be a session on evaluating collaboration and partnerships and incorporating lived experience in evaluation. Um, and Stacey is also hosting a webinar in November, which will be coordinate, uh, which will be, which will be co-presented by InfoExchange um, and exploring insights into the la latest digital technology in the not-for-profit sector survey um, and associated report, including specific data from Queensland not-for-profit organisations. So that will be a really great session as well. 
Um, last we, lastly, we have our in-person town hall events, and these town hall events have been held for the last few years across various uh, Queensland uh, locations with the sector. Um, and in these sessions, we talk about emerging issues and community priorities, and it's an opportunity to engage with the work of QCOS and inform our research and advocacy uh, work for the year ahead. Um, so our town halls are the basis of our Queensland budget submission. Uh, for example, feedback from previous town halls uh, we've informed have informed our asks for more social housing and better renting rights and more appropriate indexation for the social service organisation contracts, among other things. So personally, I really like these events. It's one of my favourite QCOS events of the year um, because we met, meet, get to meet face to face with our community sector. Um, and I also enjoy them because there's a data component to this work where we showcase the community data profiles. Um, so town halls for this year are coming to an end. However, we still have uh, events coming up in Mackay, Morden Bay and Cairns, which you can still register for. So that's all from me. I, I really want to thank our guest speakers for today, Nadia and Catherine. You've done an amazing job with data storytelling principles and um, that resource that you've shared as well is really valuable. So thank you. Um, we're just going to launch some polls uh, so that you can provide some feedback for us on, on how we did today. And I really want to just thank you to, uh, for staying online. And um, we've actually run right on time today, so I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> we usually do a little bit over, which so yeah, great, great to keep to the one uh, hour time frame. Um, so yeah, please feel free to provide us some feedback. And um, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks time for the final webinar for the data visualization series. I've just added to the resources page as well, a great link to the psychology of color. So that's on there. Oh, thanks, Catherine. Is that on the resources that you the shared? Page, yeah, that we on shared. On the SEER data, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So. We'll just keep the polls open for a couple of minutes and then I'll sign off. Just feel free to jump out if you've got other events or work to do.